Hello, I'm Eugene Reichel, uh, Director of the Center for East European and Russian Eurasian Studies, or CERES for short, at the University of Chicago. And I'd like to welcome you all to this afternoon's roundtable, What is Happening in Russia? Understanding the 2021 Protests. Today's event is sponsored by CERES with generous support from the US Department of Education Title VI National Resource Center grants. We are sharing the link to our website in the chat box, and we encourage you to visit our site and sign up for our newsletter to learn more about upcoming events and our outreach initiatives. There will be time for questions at the end of today's program. Please use the Q&A box found at the bottom of your screen. You can enter a question at any time during discussion. Today's panel will be moderated by Konstantin Sonyan. He is John Dewey Distinguished Service Professor at the University of Chicago, Harris School of Public Policy. His research interests include political economics, development, and economic theory, and his papers have been published in leading academic journals in economics and political science. Before coming to the University of Chicago, Sonyan had, among other a post a postdoc with the Harvard University's Davis Center for Russian and Eurasian Studies. He served on the faculty of the New Economic School and the Higher School of Economics in Moscow, and was also a member with the Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton. He is currently affiliated with the Higher School of Economics and the Stockholm Institute of Transition Economics as a visiting professor and advisor. And with that, I will hand it over to you, Konstantin. Um. Okay, uh, thank you, Eugene, and thank you, Sirius, for organizing this, uh, this, this event. I'm looking forward to a very interesting discussion. I just wanted to say a couple of words before I introduce the, uh, the panelists. First, in my experience, this is the first panel that I helped to assemble, in which we would have more people if those people that we would have invited or invited were not uh, in jail or under uh, under house arrest. So um, we would have another speaker if she would not be uh, under house arrest uh, under house arrest right now. The second uh, issue that I wanted to mention is that uh, it's also the first panel that I moderate in which uh, there are people panelists who are being uh, being prosecuted by the. Uh, Russian government right now. So I understand that uh, Yulia has a suspended sentence and Leonid has, um, there is a warrant issued by the uh, Russian, Russian police uh, for his arrest. The thing is that everything in which they are accused, like the, what they're accused for is totally legal. Like in the United States, it's what, um, every politician does, it's what every campaign manager does. More, or, uh, furthermore, it's not just uh, that it's legal in the United States, this is totally legal in Russia. So they're being prosecuted for what is written explicitly and provided for in the Russian constitution, in Russian laws. This does not stop uh, the Russian government of uh, trying to prosecute them. So the thing is that there is a kind of a language problem and it's not just a language problem because um, I am a native Russian speaker, but just when we say that, uh, when we say protest, it's in Russian context, it's always a peaceful protest. Then a person is getting arrested for a peaceful protest and the constitution says that it's totally legal to have a peaceful protests. It's just what is said in the constitution but this does not prevent the judge of handing uh, a heavy sentence for this and the police arresting a person and putting this person in jail. So whenever you use, whenever we use the words, uh, it should be taken into account in the, in the Russian context. Okay, uh, now I'll briefly uh, introduce the three panelists. So in the alphabetic order, Alexandra Hipova is the lead uh, so, so, social anthropologist in Russia. Also, she is one of the lead folklorists in Russia. She is a person who is basically um, responsible for uh, the sociology and anthropology of the recent protests of the last three years. Her team, I think she will talk about this, her team collects basically all we, all we know, all the sociology that is known is collected by uh, the team that, uh, that she leads. 
Um, I uh, have a couple of her books on uh, social anthropology in Russia, for example, a great, with those who read Russian, a great book of anecdotes that were told back 150 years ago about Alexander III, then about Stalin, then about Brezhnev. Now these same anecdotes are told about Putin. This is a fascinating read, but the primary reason that we have Alexandra today is that she is the lead sociologist studying, um, studying protests. Uh, the next panelist, Yule Galemina, she's also um, um, a scientist by origin. She's a linguist. She, she wrote her dissertation on the cat language. It's in a rare isolated language um, uh, in Siberia. She wrote a dissertation on this, but then she get uh, involved in politics. And for the last 15 years, the main thing that Yule does is she practicing local policies. She tries to get uh, elected to an office. She gets elected sometimes when she is elected to a municipal assembly or uh, another body. She does the work, but uh, the this is uh, this is goes uh, like on the background of a constant fighting for the existence of this local politics. So like your um, your uh, sto stories about her and her experience is the experience of a person who just tried to participate in elections and fight for the rights of those who want to participate in elections. For example, uh, she has been prosecuted by an article uh, of the Russian Criminal Code that says that it's basically legal to do political political uh, political protests. This article by itself is illegal, and the Constitution Court of Russia said so. Still, this does not prevent the authorities to uh, keep uh, coming back to uh, to Yule. Finally, the final uh, participant is um, Leonid Volkov. Leonid Volkov um, is another another example of a scientist who turned to politics uh, because being a scientist computer scientist in this case, and a successful software developer and businessman is not enough in the Russia in the 21st century. So he became first a local politician, then an opposition politician of a national fame. He managed uh, campaign, campaigns by Alexei Navalny. He's basically the person who is responsible for all the organizational um, operation of the Russian opposition of Alexei Navalny's, Navalny's team. And again, he is both a um, participant of protests and given his background and his experience, he is um, perhaps the best person to speak about um, the protest tactics and analytics of this. Okay, now the plan is that I will uh, we will give uh, time for each of the three panelists to speak, and then uh, we will have the Q and A session. Okay, so Alexandra, please go forward. Um, hi, uh, everybody. Thank you to Eugene and Esther for inviting me for having me. Um, I. Uh, is it everything okay with the sound and slides? If yeah, great. So today I'm going to talk about very shortly about the sociology of Russian political current protest and and how uh, we collect uh, that data. And our so-called team is rather big, and I should mention that uh, due to the reason. Uh, Constantine al already uh, uh, said about uh, we are not like an um, official t team. We are doing all these surveys, observations, interviewing people during pro street protests quite in unofficial way. Um, I should say like secretly um, because uh, this uh, type of uh, uh, academic uh, academic research is not supported by any institutions or any and foundations. It's all just only up to us. Uh, so, um, uh, so what we are talking about, 
we are talking about the situation which uh, turned out to be in this uh, winter and this uh, springtime. And I just quickly, uh, uh, I should remind uh, to all of you what just had happened. Then in August uh, of the last year, Alexei Navalny, the lead Russian uh, oppositioner, was arrested and, oh, sorry, was uh, poisoned uh, by the mass uh, chemical weapon uh, through his underwear. And that's why um, underwear became a, one of the main means of the uh, current protest, as you can see uh, on this picture. Then he was hospitalized in Germany. Then uh, he published a video about his investigation and he, pro made a, he proved that uh, this, uh, um, this poison, poisoning happened uh, um, uh, was made by uh, by FSB guys. Then uh, Alexei Navalny returned to Russia and he was arrested. Uh, the very famous uh, documentary film called Palace for Putin uh, was released. And uh, at the moment, the end of the January, when the first big rally started. Um, uh, during the last two weeks of January, there were big, there were big rallies in more than 100 Russian cities, and uh, that's what we were researching. So we conducted this field research in January, um, then in March, and then in April in Moscow, Saint Petersburg, and several other Russian cities. We made uh, six uh, sociological surveys. Uh, during these surveys, we asked uh, every third person in this uh, street protest. Also, we made uh, anthropological observations and we were interviewing uh, pe people. Um, so, and the main question, uh, what uh, I am going to talk about, who are these protesters? Who are these guys? Who are they? So uh, there, are, uh, there are many uh, uh, myths and rumors about these people. And among these rumors, there are three typical expectations. Uh, so those uh, regular protesters are some strange guys. There are social events. Another one that uh, Navalny, Alexei Navalny manipulates uh, school children, our kids. Uh, so there are only kids uh, who are participating in these protests. And the last one, but very popular, that it's only a small group of regular protesters who participate in these actions. So there will be and there uh, never was any newcomers. So, and let us discuss these three, three uh, very popular public expectations, public myths. So the first one that uh, those regular protesters, they have uh, their social events, so they have no regular jobs and so on. But majority of those uh, who was in our surveys, they, they have typical middle-class jobs, engineers, medical workers, lawyers, programmers, managers, and so on. Uh, uh, for, and their educational level is quite high. If you can look at this table, you can see that majority of these people, they are or students or they, uh, they already ha uh, have high education, uh, both in two cities in Moscow and St. Petersburg but it's even higher than the st standard expectation uh, from the, uh, mm, uh, uh, from the uh, uh, people from Moscow and St. Petersburg. According to sociological, sociological expectations, like a little bit less than half of the people of Moscow uh, have a higher education, but according to this survey, more than 70 protests of them participated uh, in, in the January, in the protests in January. So another, another popular myth that there are only kids 
school kids among these uh, protesters. Also, if we if we look into the age of the protesters, we can see that uh, the majority of the protesters are not school children, and they are not even young uh, young students. Uh, basically, the majority of these people are from uh, their age is from twenty five up to seventy. Sorry, thirty nine, um, and. Uh, so they are not the, this this in reality this protest is not that young how it was represented in social media and also in newspapers especially in state newspapers because state russian state newspapers they are, they love to write that there are only school children who are participated in this uh, protest now uh, and also, it's uh, it's not a unique situation. If we look uh, back in the uh, data from the pro protest in Moscow in nine, uh, 2019, we can see that also um, in the protest of two years ago, also the number of uh, uh, school children was very low and uh, the number of uh, uh, people from 25 up to 40 was quite uh, big, but now it's even bigger. And uh, if you, if we, uh, if we look into the text of our interview, we can see that this situation was a big surprise even for those who were participating. Um, it's a fragment from interview with Peter. And Piotr, he is saying that um, uh, uh, I'm, I'm really glad that people came out, both young and old. We were intimidated that Navalny wanted to take young people like children to the streets. But we can see that people here are different. There's elderly people, young people, whatever. Mm. So another mass expectation that there is a, only a small group of regular protesters who can participate in these actions. So there is no way that there will be uh, any newcomers. But according to our surveys and also our interviews, um, this uh, protest was, uh, I mean, the first, uh, the first rally in uh, January was extremely unique because the level of newcomers, those who came the first time, was quite uh, high. 42% uh, of people uh, who, uh, whom we had asked, they came the first time, despite the really bad political situation, despite the mass repression, and despite the very, very bad weather. And uh, this uh, uh, high uh, level, um, uh, we can look uh, at the data from two years ago, from the August 2019, when there was a last big uh, protest in Moscow. And when we can see that the level of newcomers was only 17%. And 17 from 15 to 17 percent is a typical normal number for newcomers. But 42 newcomers, almost half of the people who presented, it's a very high number. It means that something changed very strongly in the society that many people, despite, uh, despite their fear um, uh, of repressions, they came. Uh, also, another surprise, not that big, small surprise, was about gender of participants. Uh, basically, in Russian uh, protest, political protest, uh, the, um, the situation is followed. So, uh, it was about uh, so, uh, 35 uh, pro uh, percent for women and uh, uh, and uh, uh, 65 uh, for men. 
but and this, almost this situation was in the beginning of this uh, winter wave. Uh, the, the number of women was uh, 37 for Moscow, uh, but it was a little bigger than uh, usual. But now in April, it was almost half uh, uh, of the participant. It was uh, uh, um, uh, 48 in Moscow and 30, uh, 51 in St. Petersburg, which is extremely high. And uh, so also what people want. Uh, during the interviews, uh, we are making, we were making surveys and the sociological survey was quite short because of the danger for those who were making these interviews. But also another group of our colleagues were making uh, interviews. And during this interview and during this interview, we can see that many informants were saying that they came here to the street, but they are not supporters of Alexei Navalny, but they were always that big buts. And uh, they were saying, and well, you know, I'm not supporter of Alexei Navalny, but, and then they can hear a lot of buts that the, the political killings should be stopped. The violation of civil rights in Russia is absolutely intolerable. Uh, the 15 uh, percent of slogans also we made a database uh, of slogans during all these rallies. So the 15 percent of slogans during the first rally in January, uh, it the slogans were about disagreement with the existing uh, situ political situation. So that situation can cannot be continued. And 10, 12 percent among slogans was about fatigue from powerlessness and poverty of life of people, and also about expectations about future change. I hear some phrases from- Alexandra. I need to stop, yes, one more minute. Yes, please. So there is a few, a few quotations from interviews saying that uh, people trying to find any other future and, um, so we have conclusions. Uh, so who are they, those people who are involved in the current street protest? So basically many of them are newcomers. They came only here, only this year. They never participate in any political actions. They have higher education or they're students. And majority of them uh, are from 20s, their 20s to their 40s the number of men became almost equal to men and they are not necessarily direct, di direct followers of Navalny, uh, but they have their own political or general civil reasons to participate in these actions. Thank you. Um, thank you. Thank you very much, Alexandra. I think this is extremely interesting, this like constant renewal, uh, renewal of the protests, although the protests look very much like the protests that we had for two years, 10 years ago, it's obvious that the people that participate in these protests, half of them, at least half of them, are completely, uh, are completely, completely new. So, um, okay, our next, next speaker is Yulia Galemina. Of course, you're also in an excellent position to compare what um, was there in politics back 15, 10 years ago and, and today. Um, hello, everyone. I am Chris here. And um, uh, recently, uh, I talked about my background. And uh, so uh, you know that I was a sentence for two years uh, the probation uh, for protests. And uh, so, um, uh, so in a certain sense, uh, 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 I am a specialist on protest uh, because uh, I have uh, uh, a political uh, article for protest. So, uh, but um, um, I want uh, to talk about uh, 
uh, other things about our report, uh, which, uh, which was uh, um, led by um, famous social sociologist um, uh, Gregory Yudin, and um, this um, uh, report uh, was published on uh, uh, a website of uh, uh, Zemsky. Uh, Congress Zemsky Theater in Russian, and uh, it's um, and um, I'll uh, talk about it a, a little bit uh, later. But now I'm um, uh, talk about some conclusion of this um, report. Um, uh, <clears throat> uh, obviously, uh, um, uh, the protest of this year. Um, uh, uh, started because of Navalny's um, arrest, uh, arrests, but um, we can notice more deeper causes of this protest. Uh, and um, these are uh, causes are, um, are, is a deeper um, cri uh, political crisis of uh, political representation uh, in um, uh, modern Russia. Um, uh, and uh, the, um, our report, um, uh, in our report, we, uh, we tell about uh, these um, uh, political crises. Uh, some are conclusions from our report. Um, the most conclusion is uh, um, many people um, uh, in Russia have a request for political representation. And um, uh, this uh, request is arising uh, day by day. Um, uh, and uh, uh, if we um, look, at the uh, look at the protests uh, from this angle, uh, we can see that uh, protest is, um, uh, protests are outward manifestation of this crisis. Um, what is the problem in Russia? The more young, active and uh, not conservative, conservative people have not adequate representation on all power levels. Uh, neither uh, on the state or in the state Duma nor municipal government uh, and so on. And uh, um, this uh, misrepresentation is a deliberate uh, strategy of our authorities a base uh, of, um, and, and the base of the regime. Um, the, um, they are the authorities um, use uh, uh, four mechanism for this. First one, uh, first one is a, uh, a restriction on um, participation in election for a positional candidate. Um, <clears throat> uh, just now we can see that uh, 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 State Duma uh, adopt, uh, is adopting, uh, adopting um, uh, a new uh, law about this restriction for um, uh, Navalny supporters, for example. And um, uh, I was, uh, uh, I, I, I um, tried to take part in election uh, years, uh, two years ago uh, in Mos uh, Moscow uh, Duma, and uh, I was stopped by uh, 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 a commission uh, um, because of um, signature was uh, um, uh, signature were wrong for uh, for, for them. Right? But real people um, uh, said that um, they uh, um, support me, but they uh, say uh, they say uh, said that um, they no, um, uh, didn't exist. Uh, so um, it's uh, the interesting case. If you want, uh, I I will um, uh, tell about more. Uh, so uh, the second one is um, uh, it's a second uh, mechanism of uh, 
uh, of uh, mis or misrepresentation is falsification. Um, and uh, it's different. This, uh, um, uh, they have um, uh, they have many different uh, ways uh, to uh, to um, from ballot um, staffing and uh, so and so on. And um, um, so third uh, mechanism is um, uh, more interesting. It's the false beliefs uh, of um, um, active people about um, political preference of uh, uh, other Russian so uh, society. Uh, the active people, the oppositional people think that um, uh, have false um, uh, vision uh, uh, of um, uh, political uh, preferences of um, um, so other people. They think that all the, of them um, uh, like Putin um, and um, uh, and so on. But the um, uh, uh, and um, uh, this um, problem that um, uh, no polls, no elections don't reflect a real uh, picture uh, because of falsification, for example. And um, finally, uh, uh, sorry, uh, finally, uh, 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 the, uh, the last mechanism is um, the motivation of active P voters from participation of, uh, of um, in elections uh, because of falsification. And so it um, uh, and it's um, visual circle. Um, we have falsification, and uh, we don't uh, we don't believe in election, and uh, we don't uh, we don't take part in election, and uh, uh, there are more and more falsification, more more uh, more. Misrepresentation uh, um, in uh, uh, power levels. Uh, <clears throat> so, um, so as I said, um, the request, uh, um, the request of um, uh, political representation is rising and rising uh, um, every day, and uh, uh, so we uh, we can. Uh, and people um, is finding um, new ways for political representation. Protests uh, um, are uh, some of these ways. Uh, the protests um, uh, it's, a, it's a way for um, to be represented, uh, represented um, uh, to be um, uh, visible uh, and. Um, um the simple violence um against uh, uh, against uh, participants of protests um, uh, uh, which use uh, this which authorities use cannot to resolve this crisis it, it, uh, it become deeper and deeper because of violence uh and um, um this crisis can be resolved. Uh, um, uh, we don't know the way of, of uh, resolving, but uh, we can uh, see that uh, society uh, which have this request uh, um, become become more uh, create uh, and um, uh, become and uh, looking for new and new forms of um, uh, this representation. Um, in our report, we uh, talk about uh, these uh, forms, um, uh, my, um, uh, many or, um, different forms, but um, I want to say about um, uh, uh, the most important aspect of it, uh, on my uh, <clears throat> view, um, it's a, a, a uh, horizontal um, uh, connection uh, within our society, within the society, and uh, among um, uh, uh, local and um, uh, different leaders, 
uh, local political leaders, uh, for example. Um, and the, the new form of uh, representation, and uh, um, which based on uh, uh, organizing um, uh, horizontal connection, um, become uh, it's um, uh, Zemsky uh, Siest, Zemsky Congress, uh, which we organizing in uh, Veliki Novgorod um, uh, in uh, this May, May in two weeks. Um, uh, and it um, it uh, it will be um, a congress of uh, uh, independent municipal deputies from different um, angle of angles of uh, our uh, country, from Vladivostok and Kaliningrad and Krasnoy, uh, Darsky, Krai, and Khangilsk uh, Oblast, and uh, it's all um, from west to the. Uh, east and from north to the uh, south and all all Russia and uh, it's uh, uh, 40 uh, regions and um, it's uh, 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 the Zemsky CS organized by um, uh, very uh, very deeper democratic uh, mechanism. Uh, we all our decisions are um, uh, um, it's uh, is, is uh, a result of. Uh, voting and all our um, uh, and uh, the money uh, for this uh, congress for cities for example uh, it's uh, um, uh, uh, were collected by uh, fundraising for crowdfunding um, and uh, now we uh, collected a million rubles so it's not so big so some for Navalny, for example, no, but for municipal deputy, deputies uh, who want to organize uh, Zemsky, um, the Congress of uh, Municipal Ga, uh, Independent Municipal Yulia. Deputies, it's a big uh, sum. Julia, I'm sorry, could, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry that I have to interrupt you, but uh, we have more speakers, so could you wrap up? I, I will. You will have time when okay. we'll have Okay, I, 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 I finish. Okay, okay and, uh, great. Okay, and uh, so, so, so I want uh, to say the, um, uh, the conclusion that um, uh, um, uh, protests um, uh, uh, cannot stop by violence um, um, uh, and uh, they um, we can find other forms of uh, um, um protest uh, um, other form uh, for um to, to represent uh, our political um uh, interests uh thank you okay uh, thank you Yulia. I, I i think this uh, you, you made a very important point about the current crisis in russia that it it's its core it's a crisis of political political representation that people do want to elect more people like Yulia and what we've seen from Yulia's biography from the uh, excellent sociology work by Grigory Yudin and his team that uh, like what the government does is basically they try to stop this um, uh, this resolving the crisis of political representation they just fight like basically every independent candidate trying to run at municipal level. So we are looking forward, uh, I'm looking forward to the Zemsky Sabor uh, that will be um, organized in May, but just for the listeners, uh, in April, a group of municipal deputies tried to meet in Moscow and they were all arrested. I think Yulia, you were a part of this group. They were all arrested just for gathering to get together and trying to exchange views. It was not even a protest. It was just a meeting of the independent uh, independent delegates um, across Russia. Okay, so now our uh, last panelist, uh, Leonid Volkov, perhaps about attempts to um, get, get a political organization at the national level, at least of the experience of doing so. Uh, so, hello everyone. So, I'll try to be short because the always the most interesting part of events like this is, of course, the QA session. But, well, uh, so I'll not be able to bring us back 
to on the schedule while because this would require require me to talk for minus two minutes, which is not possible for me, but I'll try to keep it short. So while Alexandra have was- your, Have uh, your 10 minutes, have your 10 minutes. <laughs> while, while Alexandra was uh, uh, talking about like the past, the uh, polling of the participants of the January protest and Julia about the current, I'll talk of the about the future, of course. And uh, well, we are the Russia of the future, party at the end of the day, and we talk about the metaphoric, beautiful Russia of the future a lot of time. So, and the future is brilliant, and the future is good, and it was never a better time for the political opposition in Russia as it is now. So, and I'm very optimistic. To comprehend it, so how could we stay optimistic while Alexei Navalny is imprisoned, while we have faced an enormous wave of of repression in January and April with like over 14,000 people arrested, detained, which effectively makes it the, the largest wave of repression in our country since Stalin times. Uh, the answer is simple. Uh, the answer has been given by Alexei Navalny on many occasions. And it is that you have to consider the bigger picture. You have to zoom out a little bit of all the uh, small problems of the current day. And the bigger picture is nice. The fundamental reasons for the protests in Russia will not be gone. Putin could destroy physically with excavators and bulldozers all the Navalny regional offices. This will not help him to fight corruption. And corruption is enormously important because of the 10 years of tremendous previous work accomplished by Alexei Navalny and his team and the Anti-Corruption Foundation. Now, according to the polls, 59% of Russians uh, accept, anticipate that corruption is the major problem for our country. This is very important because corruption is something that Putin can't, fight, can't effectively fight. Putin, I mean, pretty much every country in the world uh, faces corruption as an issue, as a problem, uh, as a problem, and many governments try to fight against corruption. Putin's government doesn't have such a privilege because they are corruption. They they can't be uh, like distinguished from corruption. Corruption is their basis. Is a is how this government, how this state, how this uh, organization operates. Uh, so. They managed to increase the perception of, of corruption as a major problem, uh, enormously, and this will not be gone. This is an issue that Putin can't resolve. It will stay with him forever, and it, it will always cause a lot of pressure on the regime. Second, even if Putin, I don't know, like uh, declares everyone uh, who was associated with Navalny in any capacity, as an outlaw, what he effectively does, it will not help. It will not help uh, him to resolve the very basic issues that, like every household in Russia faces. The average household income decreases for eight years in a row now. This is a consequence of corruption, of economic stagnation, of sanctions, of inefficient government. This is all. I mean. These are intersecting thresholds, but uh, all, all of them contribute to the fact that the economy is doing bad and will not get better soon. And of course, there is nothing Putin could do with the fact that he is there in power for almost 22 years in a row now, and people are just very tired. They are very naturally tired of it. So, I mean, a whole generation has appeared, and like Alexandra's study uh, shows it very clearly, as a, there is a whole generation who hasn't seen anything but Putin and that wants to think to see anything else. So these fundamental factors are always here, and they will only increase in, they will only gain importance, they will only gain. Um, influence on, on, on the political agenda. We don't know why and how uh, the regime change will come, but we are quite sure about several concrete things. 
The first thing is that the regime will not ever survive Putin. It's very, it's a personalistic autocracy. It's built on an, uh, it, it relies upon many personal ties that Putin has with uh, his lieutenants, his cronies. He is an arbiter, he balances the system, he resolves their internal conflicts. He, he does it quite efficiently, but when he is gone, or for whatever reason, biological reason, a palace coup, an uprising, some black swan type event, doesn't matter. But when, when he's gone for whatever reason, all these personal ties will be distracted and the, 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 um, the well-organized, well-run body of, of, of Kremlin uh, political organization uh, will, will fall. It, there will be just an enormous fight of everyone against everyone. And our, tasks, our task remains the same. We have to be the largest, the best organized political organization in the country by the moment of time when it happens with no regard to when it actually happens and for whatever reason. So we can't really influence the probability of the biological death of Mr. Putin and we don't want to. And we can't influence the probability of a black swan type event of something really random like uh, the events that ignited the Arab Spring 10 years ago. But we have to grow and to build up as an organization. And we succeed so. So we started 10 years ago with a small group of people. So Alexei Navalny had maybe something like 50,000 followers when he was uh, just a live journal blogger. Who knows live journal now? Now our daily reach is about 10 million people. That, that's the number of people that we are able to communicate with when we want to publish something, to write something, to stream something. This is the amount of people that would listen to it or uh, read it or some, somehow interact with this. So it's a 200-fold growth over 10 years, which is, well, I would say Tesla and Bitcoin comparable. And in very toxic environment under very harsh uh, circumstances, we will be able to maintain the growth. This this growth because all the fundamental reasons for this growth are here, and it makes us, of course, very optimistic about Russian future. So we don't have to give up. We have to continue working. We have to be like Alexei is used to say to be to be like water. So that they, they punch and we kind of avoid because we are fluent, we are flexible, we are managed to we, we manage to regroup, to reorganize ourselves ourselves so that any new uh, instance, any new implementation of our movement is something that uh, Putin's regime is not ready to, to fight against. And that's what we are doing now. So right now we are inside such a uh, reorganization. So we really have to rethink many processes. It's clear that Navalny offices, Navalny regional offices are gone, that like electoral campaigns as we used to uh, manage them a couple of years ago are gone. And many forms of the protests that we are used to are gone, also the street protests. But it opens us to many new opportunities. We are exploring them. We are ready to learn. We are ready to launch new projects. We'll soon announce some of them. And of course, some of our old projects uh, are not exhausted. The smart voting, of course, is a main challenge uh, for Kremlin. Uh, it does a lot of lawmaking to prevent a smart voting to prevail in September. But um, based on our experience from 2019 and 2020 regional elections, we expect that we still will be able to win about 20 seats, 20% 20 of um, seats in a single vote uh, district constituencies. And this will be a major disaster for uh, Putin and for the United Russia. This will change Russian political landscape a lot. So this is my short and optimistic outline of the nearest uh, future and 
let's jump as soon as possible to the Q&A, which is always the most interesting part of such conversations. Um, thank you. Thank you, Lenny. It's heartwarming to see so much uh, optimism on such a grim subject as the protest of 2021. So there are already very good questions. I especially like a question by Professor Scott Gelbach, who is a political economist with a school who study political history of Russia. He asks why, um, why it's difficult to bring working class voters into anti-Putin coalition. Expect this from someone who studies Russian history. But, but the, first, the first question that I'm, I'm going to ask will be different. It's also related to the questions that are asked uh, by participants of the, in the Q&A session. This is a question about the, uh, the political, political repressions, because maybe it's not rising to the level of Stalin's terror, because people are not being executed in mass, people are not uh, sent by hundreds of thousands into concentration camps. But certainly what we've seen in 2021, this is a huge escalation. The scale of repression, of political repression is higher than in Soviet Union. Thousands of people were arrested. Hundreds of people are prosecuted. People get years in jail for retweet. People uh, who are famous poets or writers or even high school teachers, they are getting arrested and spend time uh, in jail because they just posted, um, ma made a post that they're going to, to go into a protest or something like this. Just yesterday, uh, the former mayor of Yekaterinburg got uh, days in jail because of participation, um, of just his personal participation in a meeting for which the right is provided by the constitution. So uh, my question is, uh, first, how, uh, how far could this go? Could they just increase the scale? For example, Professor Nalepa asked the question, why wouldn't they just kill Navalny upon, um, upon uh, his return to Russia? Why are they killing him uh, in, a, in a kind of a slow way in prison? Uh, also, the question is, do you think that there will be further ex ex escalation of repressions? And do you think that these repressions, just the physical assault on opposition, would have um, serious consequences on behavior of people? Would people fear? Would people stop um, posting to, um, to social media because they're being intimidated and then you could get years uh, in prison just because you post something on social media? So I will just ask you in turn, so Alexandra. Uh, Alexandra, did you hear my question? It's about what you what you make of the current escalation of repressions. Will there be future more repressions? Would it have um, some impact on how people behave? Well, we are not doing progno any any type of prognosis. It's not our field of expertise. But when when a person says when a person comes to protest that is um, uh, that is caused by the fact that Navalny is arrested and says that this person says that she came here because uh, not because of Navalny. What do you think? Is this an impact of this increased scale of repression? Mm, no, it's because uh, Navalny, Alexei Navalny is like only one figure who can join a very different people with different political views uh, to to go into some uh, any sort of public uh, public uh, protest, and um, many people feel they disagree with uh, political views of Navalny. Uh, they consider him too much, uh, being too much nationalist or being less nationalist than they want. They don't like his position on, on Crimea, for example, something, something less, but uh, they, uh, they still 
want to fight for civil rights. And the, this, this is one of the main uh, points in all this, in this story. So you do not think that they actually came to support Navalny, but because of fear to say this, because they think Navalny is an enemy of Putin, I do not want to be an enemy of Putin, they give a kind of uh, another answer. No, I don't think so. I think that uh, in, uh, currently, in our, currently in Russian society, this, uh, this is idea that we should support uh, Navalny and his fight uh, ne, uh, uh, without uh, past our views to, uh, to his political positions. Okay. Uh, nevertheless, Alexei said in past, now we should support his fight. This is quite a big, uh, this is a general idea in this political uh, um, uh, protest protest okay thank you julia uh, uh so the same question about the role of the repression what you expect where they ex uh, whether they will escalate and this will have an impact but also a kind of a personal question do you fear i mean maybe next time they will not only arrest all the municipal uh deputies they will just send everyone to jail do you like does it affect your uh, your behavior? Um, my answer based on um, our report that, that um, um, under the violence, um, author authorities, violence, um, uh, our own society become more and more creative. And we find no new forms of um, our uh, of protests, uh, for example, and for and you find uh, we find the new um, <clears throat> place of po uh, political place. For example, uh, charts in WhatsApp and the for neighborhood charts or parents charts and so on. Um, and um, it's the first um, answer. The second answer that uh, this. Um, 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 uh, violence uh, uh, created uh, the new type of leader. Uh, it's an, um, um, there are many um, new leaders uh, in Russia who um, uh, don't want uh, uh, who uh, who, uh, who don't uh, fear uh, and they uh, know anything uh, or think about. Uh, um risks about uh, jail about, and so on but they um and, uh, they want to be a leaders and um, uh, not only uh, municipal deputies it's uh, small 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 towns for example and uh, they want to um to be a uh, politician and uh, in their local level regional level and so on. Uh, and um, I think that um, the key uh, um, is uh, distributed leadership. It's key for Russian society. Not one leader, but uh, uh, distributed leadership. Uh, oh. And um, uh, it's, uh, as for me, to, I don't... Uh, <laughs> I don't jail. It's not a problem for me. I think I. Uh, it's it was a, a real thing for five months ago because um, uh, it was a real, a real um, uh, thinker uh, in my uh, court. Uh, uh, they asked me uh, two years uh, uh, jail of jail, but uh, it's. Uh, the, the last uh, in the last time um, uh, they changed it uh, on a uh, not real uh, a, re a real prison okay so you so you were ready to go to to, to, to the real prison I, I understand that they first yes and my husband too and my children too <laughs> it's uh, um if you want to be a, a politician in, uh, in russia you um, uh, you should you should ready to, uh, to go to prison as Navalny, for right. example. Uh, uh.
Okay, and I think Alexei Navalny like was incredibly, incredibly brave, and he certainly demonstrated that you that he was prepared to go uh, to go to prison to return to Russia. So, uh, Leonid, what what do you expect? I mean, like uh, theoretically, um, I I think that the main explanation why they uh, prosecute Navalny and uh, Navalny and his team is basically because they see the real strength. They fear that this is a political force that um, not only represents tens of millions of Russians, but because this is an actual political political challenge. But what are going to to do going forward um, in 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 the view of these escalating repressions? As, uh, as I, sorry, yes. Uh, as I already mentioned, uh, I, I, I think that the street protest in that form that we've seen it in January is gone. And it's, it's not a big problem. So just we don't, I mean, they have shown that they are ready to escalate the level of repressions. And yeah, they really like have where to go. So, I mean, they could do more. They they could uh, apply more violence to the protesters. They're very ready uh, to do this. Uh, even now, like every protesters, every protester represents maybe fifty or one hundred others who are not ready to turn out under these conditions, with this level of risk, with the risk of being expelled from the university. Uh, being hired, fired from your job, get an enormous fine, uh, get 30 days of arrest, or even become like a criminal convict. Uh, and so, so for everyone who participate in those rallies, there are much more people that for very valid reasons have chosen not to attend uh, because they were not able to face the risks that the government have has prepared for them. So it doesn't mean that there will be no more protests, but it means for me that the next protest will be not prepared, not planned. So probably this will not be uh, any more anytime soon that someone will announce. So we are scheduling the protest for this day. So we are getting prepared, we are distributing leaflets, we are talking about this future protest, and then it happens. So Putin's last, Kremlin's last actions uh, have made it impossible for the time being. But this only will denote that the next protest will be an ex-prompt sparked by some random event. So once again, as it was, for instance, in Tunisia in 2011. Uh, is it good? No, of course it's not good. Uh, is it inevitable? Yeah, I think so. Now, there was a question like about uh, uh, Navalny, uh, why he's imprisoned, why he's not murdered, and how movement could, how the movement could survive without without him. So, first of all, the question why did Navalny return to Russia uh, is not valid because we did not have any discussion of this kind ever. It was clear for everyone that even when he was still unconscious in coma there in Berlin, that he, of course, would return. And the explanation is very clear. I mean, he's a Russian politician. He did not do anything wrong or illegal. He is a leader who always wanted to be and wants to be with, uh, with the people. He belongs there. And he has gone through enormous risks through, uh, during the last 10 years uh, of his political career. He was attacked and harassed many times physically. He narrowly lost an eye uh, uh, during an attack with a chemical liquid in 2017. He uh, faced multiple criminal charges and was convicted to suspend the sentence many times. He spent one year under house arrest and month in jail in those infamous detention centers after peaceful rallies. Not coming back would just nullify all those risks, would, would just uh, make him admit 
that all these risks that he has already gone through were, were for nothing, um, were useless. Of course, it was this question was never on the table. We always knew uh, he he would return once he rehabilitated. Uh, and uh, the question why he was imprisoned and not murdered immediately sounds also a little bit naive to me because uh, if you recall, uh, they didn't try to kill him in August 2020. They did try to kill him so that it looks like a heart attack. Their right. aim was they didn't shoot him in his forehead. They, their aim was that the plane lands and there is a dead body and any doctor recognizes it was just a heart attack. They wanted to kill him cover covertly. So now when he is actually in custody uh, of the Russian state and everyone knows who, who bears full responsibility over his uh, health and well-being, of course, we don't expect them to kill him immediately. The risks will grow if he gets forgotten. And this is, of course, our primary task, not to let him be forgotten, uh, for him to become more and more of a symbol of protest. And this is the answer to the last question that I wanted to address, uh, that uh, we don't need a new leader. We have a leader, we have a symbol, we have someone with whom everyone who is against Putin for whatever reason is ready to associate now because Putin himself has very clearly indicated who is his foremost and most important enemy. This is also what Alexander's findings are about. Many people attended the rallies not because they are pro Navalny, but because they are, are anti-Putin, anti-regime. Navalny has become a clear like crystallization point for everyone who is against Putin. And he will perfectly and brilliantly serve as such a crystallization point, even if he unfortunately has to remain uh, in prison for, for some more time. Of course, we have to do whatever possible to get him out of there because out of prison, he could be even more efficient, much more efficient uh, than now. But as of now, we are in touch with him. We are able to communicate with him about like our projects and our initiatives. Our movement knows what to do and he's, he's still our leader and he serves us in, in this capa capacity perfectly, but also he's gaining more and more moral weight and attracting more and more compassion among Russian uh, people, also those who previously were not so much interested about politics and so on. And this is also a very important thing that is happening. We actually see a lot of change in people's attitude towards uh, Alexei Navalny now. And this, this change um, is exactly realized in growth of compassion level. More and more people tend to think that what government does to Alexei Navalny now is very unfair. Right. Is, is, is a sign of clear injustice. I mean, that's uh, that's that's almost obvious. I, I I know a lot of people in Russia, including like f friends who are not supportive of Navalny, but they're also not supportive of the idea that opposition leaders should be killed. So they, some of them, even participated in these demonstrations. Again, not because they really support Navalny, but because they think that uh, they would want to vote against him rather than have him uh, him killed or uh, or imprisoned. Okay, uh, I'm, I'm going to ask the next question, sort of trying to summarize what is in the interesting Q and A sessions. And I will start. I will start with Lenin, uh, just so that we have turns in different directions. So the question is that for many for many years, it seems that the Putin government. It relied, Kremlin relied very much on, on propaganda. They spent an enormous amount of money, like an American, American student wouldn't imagine how much money could the government spend just on producing all kinds of propaganda, how much money they feed into all kinds of internet firms that create bots and trolls. And like Americans, they got a glimpse of this because there was some tiny participation of Russian bots and trolls in American elections in 2016, and Americans cannot still get over this. But the Russians get like 100 times more of this, 100 times 
more money are, sp are spent on influencing Russian's opinions, like basically every social media, everything. But at the same time, what we've seen, we've seen this escalation of repressions, which means that propaganda basically no, no longer works. If propaganda works, why would you have to arrest hundreds of thousands of people, hundreds and uh, thousands of people? So my question is, do you like detect this thing that propaganda actually no longer works despite an enormous spending of money and resources? Leonid. Uh, well, um, <laughs> propaganda is inefficient because the propaganda is also, it's, it's a propaganda of the of a corrupt government in a corrupt country. So the, the yeah, I mean, the annual budget of, of Russia today, one of the propaganda vehicles, and not the largest one, like the, the first and second uh, channel and uh, NTV are larger, is like 25, 23 billion rubles a year, which is mm, 40 times larger than the budget of the Anti-Corruption Foundation. But as our recent investigation has revealed, <laughs> they are just wasting this, uh, this money for for nothing to to produce to produce actually a very uh, low quality uh, propaganda product. Uh, I mean, uh, people in our country are actually experienced to distinguish like propaganda uh, and and uh, sincere uh, words because also they many of them have this. Uh, trauma and experience of, of living uh, in, in a communist um, under communist regime when also everything was uh, propaganda. I've seen it many times that people who you who still use uh, television as the only uh, media as the only source of political information don't trust it. I mean people are able to understand, uh, when a TV host is, is lying to them. Uh, only, the only problem is that they don't have a, a second point. Uh, point. They, they don't have access to a second opinion. So, I mean, a TV host is saying to them that, I mean, they're in the Ukraine, uh, they eat children alive. They don't have access to a uh, competitive uh, Oh, I, uh, I, uh, uh, opinion. There are, there are uh, media uh, who says that Ukrainians yeah. do not actually eat. Yeah, yeah, eat opinion. Yeah. So they have to discount this. They they know uh, what 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 that that what was they said on television is a lie, but they don't know how exactly to discount it. So they probably assume that the Ukrainians first boil them and then eat something like this. So, but I mean, the level of trust. Uh, for for what TV propaganda is saying is is very low, and uh, the actually the, the influence of this propaganda is is decreasing, also along with generational change and with growing internet penetration. I I wouldn't overestimate its importance because I think it has reached uh, the the maximum levels of of uh, the mobilization it it could have reached. It's still important. It's still huge, but it's not almighty. Thank, thanks. Let me let let me ask uh, Alexander basically about the effectiveness of propaganda. So uh, we've seen the structure of the protests, the age structure of the protests, for example. We also now know from sociological studies that people in Russia, like the young people, they basically they watch internet, they get the information from the internet. And people of older age, they uh, trust television more. They spend more time watching television. Do you think there is still uh, a big impact on, of television on what happens in protests? Uh, well, this uh, TV impact, it's very high on, as you told, on uh, older generation. Uh, and uh, and yes, that's now it became the war between uh, two generations, basic uh, uh, at least in the big cities. So and I think that now um, 
now the state TV propaganda is losing uh, its, uh, its positions. So yes, it's becoming okay. better. Thanks. Julia, I also wanted to ask you this question about propaganda because, of course, being a municipal deputy, you talk to people who elect you and you talk to other municipal deputies. So do you feel the impact, impact of television on what is on people's minds? And do you think that it's changing? Yes. <clears throat> no. In the, it's uh, it's changing uh, every day. Um, the last news that um, number of people who um, get uh, information from internet uh, uh, is more than uh, number of people uh, became, became more uh, than the number of people who get information from uh, TV. It's uh, the last news um, and. Um, uh, but uh, um, <clears throat> but about my experience, um, I know that uh, um, people uh, believe uh, uh, TV uh, propaganda. But if uh, you uh, we can um, change it, uh, if you show them a uh, problem in a uh, local level, for example, and uh, uh, how uh, how. Um, um deputies uh, are of um, um uh, union uh, union Russia, um, um, uh, uh, box again uh, walk again again their interests for example and uh, so on you if our people um, uh, <clears throat> to, if people take par uh, part in uh, Real, um, uh, real things and uh, real uh, political life. Uh, their um, uh, mind is changing. They um, see that uh, authorities, uh, authorities um, are, um, use, use corruption uh, for their interests in uh, under their steps. Are um, uh, the chair? For example, for example, roads uh, or, uh, or um, road stations, uh, railway stations, or uh, for example, schools and so on. And uh, they see the, uh, these um, examples of corruption, not be corruption of uh, Putin's, uh, the Putin, but um, Putin is a big, um, big uh, man. He can, uh, he can. Um, uh, um, use a bigger um, uh, house, how called castle, yes. Uh, I, I forget the word. Uh, what? Uh, so, um, uh, but uh, if we, uh, they see the corruption under their uh, step, they can um, can understand that uh, it's um, a problem. That's uh, they. Uh, begin to think about this, about uh, a propaganda, about and step by step, step by step, we can think about Putin too, not uh, immediately. I, uh, I, I see. So uh, I think we have time for one more uh, short, uh, short question. So I'm, I, I, I'm just uh, wondering, what do you think is going to is going to happen? Could you make uh, could you make a guess? Would there be a major, a major development in uh, in the next couple of years, Leonid? So uh, I'm not actually. I mean, frankly, my my horizon of planning is not that long. So well, of course, uh, actually, the main event of the if 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 we consider the frame of a couple of years. The main event is the, is the transition of 2024. Uh, Putin uh, spares many opportunities for himself. He doesn't want to be that rat in a corner, so he keeps many options open. Uh, he might choose to transfer the, the presidential power from himself to himself. He might choose to, he, he choose to appoint someone else and to step aside as a head of the uh, 
Gossavet, which is like the state council, or, or anything else. No, it's, it's, it's important for him. It's his management model that he created such a artificial uh, uh, voidness so that, that, that he could kind of keep everyone, you know, <laughs> energized and, and, and to make the decision in the very last moment. But the events in Belarus uh, have educated him that even in transition of himself to himself, could not be uh, an easy challenge, even so, if so. You, you think that he could uh, that he could uh, arrest hundreds of thousands of people because in Belarus they have 35,000 35, people arrested, and Belarus is a tiny country. So, like a yeah. corresponding number for Russia will be I don't know a million people. 500,000, if you take the proportion. Well, you know, uh, Russian prison population has decreased from 700,000 to 320,000 uh, within the last uh, 10 years. So they have 380,000 spare seats somewhere there in Russian prisons, technically. <clears throat> so, I mean, having said that, uh, I would, I would remain quite optimistic. So once again, Putin is facing uh, the challenge with his transition. And he already realizes that this transition will be uh, a big headache for him. So now on the short term, it's very essential for him to, to have a, a clean, a sterile uh, Duma that would be completely under his control. Because this is also what Lukashenko did. Before long, Lukashenko used to have a couple of quasi-opposition -oppos politicians uh, in his parliament, but he wiped, him away, uh, wiped them away shortly before his re-election to ensure that no one could claim any kind of legitimacy uh, during his uh, transition period. It was very important for him that no one could emerge and say, okay, you know, people voted for, for me. I am uh, a, an elected official and I'm ready to, to take the side of the people and, and to lead the people. As it happened in the Ukraine during the Maidan of 2014, when like a third maybe of, of, of parliament members sided with the, with the protesters. In, in Belarus, no one sided. It's important also for Putin to have this Duma like completely clean and predictable. And that's exactly uh, the issue that uh, smart voting is targeting. We expect Action. that the, the Duma will not be that clean as Putin wants it to, uh, to be. And this will actually draw a, a red line and kind of restrict him, restrain him in his uh, desire also to have a smooth transition in 2024. Hostel looks like you are a little bit hang up now. Yeah, Costa seems to have disconnected. So if 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 ah yeah, Costa now you are back, but your mic was off. Yeah. Okay. Could I ask the same question uh, from Julia? Mm. Uh, it's a very difficult. Uh... Difficult question. I don't know um, uh, how um, our country goes um, to the future, but um, I know one thing that uh, one day it's um, this situation uh, will change, uh, and um, uh, it from um, we have a new uh, generations of people. Uh, and uh, this generation have uh, the, another quest for political life, uh, 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 and um, they want to to be represented. So, uh, and the more important thing is uh, uh, political participation of um, uh, people, and. Um, and uh, this uh, key of uh, changing, and uh, if uh, Putin uh, uh, go away, it's not uh, um, uh, it's, uh, it's not uh, 
uh, um, it not means uh, mean that uh, uh, all things changes. Uh, um, will change if for uh, our society is uh, um, uh, our society change. Uh, <clears throat> it's uh, uh, if for many people uh, um, understand, uh, understand that. Uh, they should uh, uh, took part in po political life, and that uh, it's um, uh, their our their house, their um, street, their town is uh, the, the sphere of ear, their response, and this um, um, and. Uh, uh, only this can uh, change uh, the situation in our uh, country. Um, but uh, um, Putin, uh, or maybe it's maybe maybe that Putin, if only uh, change Putin to us Putin, to no, uh, no, not uh, it's uh, no change in uh, in Russia. Okay. Thanks. Could I ask this same question to Alexandra uh, very briefly? Do you expect major changes in the next couple of years? You are muted. I think that the biggest uh, challenge is waiting for all of us this autumn will be uh, during the election and uh, during the pre-election time. That will be quite interesting for everybody, and I so hope... not, not August when we Russians traditionally expect something to happen. Um, for those who don't know, in a lot of events in Russia happen uh, in August for some for some unknown reason. So August and September is going to be interesting. It's maybe okay, it will thank change you. the situation a lot. Thank you, Alexandra. I think. Our time is up. I just wanted to thank the panelists, first, uh, the series organizers. I'm very sorry that we were not able to bring uh, our panelists, Yulia, Alexandra, Leonid, uh, to, to the beautiful campus of the University of Chicago. I hope we will do this. Uh, we will do this in the future. But thank you. And this is the end. Thank you so much and yes let's let's meet in person as soon as possible